is me once again, David Dominguez. I'm from the Eco Aqua Institute of University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria in Spain. I'm a postdoc here and I've been working on the Perform Fish uh, project since the very beginning, since 2017. I did part of my PhD actually. Uh, I did it on the Perform Fish, especially, specifically on the mineral trials. So I'll be presenting recommended dietary levels of minerals for gillhead seabream. The gillhead seabream, Sparus aurata, is one of the most produced fish species in the EU. Actually, it's the third most produced species in the EU, where it is mainly produced in the Mediterranean countries, being Turkey and Greece, the main producers. In the last couple of decades, we've seen this trend in, in the worldwide aquaculture to shift the, the, the ingredient sources of the feed from predominantly marine ingredients, specifically fish meal and fish oil, to more alternative ingredients, which were usually plant, uh, plant ingredients. We've seen this in the Norwegian salmon industry since the 90s, and we've also seen this in gillhead seabream industry. Here I'm introducing two different projects. As you can see, Araina was, you could almost talk as the prelude to the perfume fish. This was an EU funded project that finished, I think it was in 2016, and which I also participated. And we were trying to reduce and to force the, the formulation to contain lower levels of fish meal and fish oil. And with the results from Araina, we designed some of the trials here in the Perform Fish project. And as you can see, the percentage of uh, marine ingredients has been even lower in Perform Fish. However, this change from marine to plant ingredients may alter the mineral profile of the feeds. Take, for example, these two common ingredients used in, in marine fin fish, fin fish diets, uh, fish meal and soy. As you can see, Certain minerals are present in higher proportions in marine ingredients, like selenium and zinc, while others are higher in plant ingredients, like copper and manganese. So to this, we must also add another handicap, such as the presence of anti-nutritional factors and mineral collectors that are reducing the viability of these minerals. And we also have, uh, we can have batch variation for different ingredients of plant origins, for example, selenium. And how should we, should we really pay attention to this? Well, as you can imagine, these micronutrients are essential. Uh, for example, manganese is an essential component of metalloenzymes, intermediate carbohydrate, lipid and protein metabolism. Uh, manganese superoxide dismutase is one of the three uh, superoxide dismutase is found in vertebrates and it is responsible for this mutation of reactive oxygen species and therefore it's, an, it's essential for the antioxidant defense. It can be uh, used interchangeably with magnesium due to its uh, similar chemical properties and it's also involved in bone formation where it accounts for up to 40 percent of the total manganese stored in humans. And it's usually, um, it, can, it, it can be absorbed through the, through the gills, uh, waterborne. However, the main source of manganese is the diet because you have calcium and phosphorus present in the water, which reduces its bioavailability. And the transport in the diet is mainly through the intestine, of course, by active or passive transport. It arrives to the liver where it is redistributed to different tissues uh, and then it's excreted through the bile. Manganese toxicities, the risk is quite low. Then it includes uh, symptoms such as altered intestinal immunity and deficiencies are, can be, are, more, uh, are more common and include reduction in growth, cataracts, higher mortality, a reduced manganese superoxide dismutase, etc. And nowadays we have several uh, commercial sources for manganese, including sulfates and oxide, but also amino acid chelates. 
Selenium is another essential trace element. Uh, it's involved in the thyroid hormone and the proper functioning of the immune reproductive systems. And it also plays an important role in the reduction of oxidative stress by forming part of the cellular proteins, including glutathione peroxidase. Selenium deficiency uh, presents symptoms such as poor growth, uh, mortality, uh, reduced uh, glutathione peroxidase, and selenium toxicity associates uh, causes is caused by association with sulfur-containing amino acids, which alters their structure. And under stressful conditions, selenium requirements uh, can be increased to levels that would be considered toxic during normal conditions. And this um, this uh, um, toxicity may also be influenced by the source of supplementation. There are different sources of supplementation. We have, uh, for example, selenomethionine, uh, as, uh, and then we have selenites and selenite, etc. Then copper is the last trace element I will be talking about in this presentation. It's also essential. We need to include it in the diet because it, it forms part of the antioxidant defense by forming part of the copper zinc superoxide dismutase. It also takes part in the production of energy at the cellular level, in neurotransmission, in collagen synthesis and melanin production. Dietary copper is absorbed through the intestine and transported to the liver, where it is distributed to the tissues, mainly by cerebroplasmin and excess copper as manganese is excreted through the bile. Copper deficiencies tend to be rare and are, and they tend to, to cause a reduction in growth, a reduction in copper tissue levels. Um, however, uh, the same redox properties that allow copper to eliminate free radicals and able to promote reactions that lead to the production of reactive oxygen species, which is quite interesting. And this can have damaging effects on cellular macromolecules. Copper may also manifest toxicity by displacing zinc from functionally essential protein domains, causing a zinc deficiency. Freshwater species are particularly susceptible to copper toxicity since the lower levels of cations in the water increases its bioavailability to be absorbed through the gills therefore increasing the burden of total copper uptake. And there are different sources of copper in the diet, commercial sources, once again, copper sulfate and amino acid chelates and copper methionine. So with all this in mind, we come to the conclusion that yes, we have a series of essential nutrients. We have these uh, nutrients that have to be included in the diet. And actually, some mineral requirements have been already described for species, including Atlantic salmon, several species of grouper, other marine species such as uh, cobia. However, the mineral requirements, sorry, for gilded seabream are yet unknown, despite being the third most produced fish species in the EU, or were well known when we started this project. And Furthermore, we have to include that the EFSA, the European Food Safety Authority, has established upper limits of supplementation for these minerals, which means that if we have a level beyond 25 milligrams per kilogram of copper in our feed, this is above the upper limit, and therefore we cannot use this feed. We cannot use this feed if we have if we want to supplement copper, if this is present in the diet, in the, in the basal diet, in the basal feed, then it's okay. And then the case of selenium, for example, is also very interesting. We have a, a, an upper limit of 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, but if we're using selenium methionine, this goes down to 0 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. And we'll talk about these implications later on. But how do we define a requirement? How do we pinpoint the exact uh, the exact concentration, dietary concentration that we need to include in a diet. How do we do this scientifically? Well, traditional requirements 
experiments alter the single parameter, in this case, one of these minerals, and evaluated the effects of that parameter on fish. So this was an independent variable. And we use we can use different criteria, for example, growth, gene expression, tissue deposition, retention of the mineral, etc. In this case, we can use broken line regressions, in which two lines, uh, in, the, in which the intersection of these two lines will give you the requirement. We have very nice examples in the literature for this. This case for manganese, for instance. There are also other ways of defining the requirement, nonlinear models, quadratic regressions, uh, exponential regressions, sigmoidal regressions, which tend to adapt more to, they are more flexible, they tend to adapt more to the, to the outcome of the trial, they tend to adapt more to the dependent variable, and therefore many authors consider this more accurate ways of measuring, uh, of defining a requirement. And we also have very nice examples in the literature. So when Perform Fish uh, was designed, one of the, of the main ideas that we had was, okay, we have this huge gap of knowledge in micronutrient requirements for, for Sebring, and we need to, to fulfill it. We need to, to know what these fish require. And what these fish require for manganese, selenium, and copper. So following the previous slides, what we did is that for each of these uh, trace elements, we designed a trial in which we had five different levels of each of these uh, minerals. Level number three, would be what would be considered a requirement for other species that were very similar to Sebrim, or what would be uh, observed in previous trials that we had conducted that, that would have been like the optimum level. Level number one would be a diet without supplementation of this mineral, and level number five would be an excess. If this would be two to four times uh, the amount present in level number three. And we had a basal diet, which was common for all these three trials. And as you can see, this had low levels of fish meal and fish oil to emulate the trend of the industry. These diets were, were produced by Sketing, which is also another partner of the project. And we had these three different trials in which copper was supplemented as copper sulfate manganese as manganese sulfate and selenium as sodium selenite in five different levels, as you can see. The conditions of these trials were very similar. We had three tanks for each of the diets. We had around 450 to 525 fish per trial, depending on the trial, which was from 30 to 35 fish per tank. This fish initial weight was around 12 or 20 grams depending on the trial and they were manually fed until apparent satiation three times per day for six or ten weeks depending on the trial and we always finish the trial when fish were at least uh, double the weight that they were when they started the trial and at the end of the trial, we collected samples for biochemical analysis, mineral composition, vertebral morphology, skeletal anomalies, histology, gene expression, and of course, statistical analysis. So I'm going to be presenting very briefly these results for the manganese, selenium, and copper trials. So this, the first trial, the trial on manganese uh, was published a couple of years ago in aquaculture and it's uh, open access so if anyone is interested in it just let me know and i will i will send, gladly send it to you and these results from in terms of growth and productive parameters of this trial suggested that 19 milligrams per kilogram of manganese was sufficient to cover manganese requirements for growth since there were no differences, no statistical differences for these parameters. 
And actually, these values are close to those described as optimum for all species, such as rainbow trout and cobia. And, and this, of course, led us to think, since this it was the minimum level is 19 milligrams per kilogram, could there be an optimum level below 19 milligrams per kilogram? And the fact is that uh, right now it's very difficult to, to, to find out because we have practical diets with uh, vegetable meals, with plant ingredients, which already contain high levels of manganese. As you could remember from one of the first slides, when we included uh, soy, we had higher levels of manganese present in the diet. Whereas other studies like this uh, conducted in cobia and rainbow trout were based on semi-purified diets and using fish meal, which has lower levels of manganese. So we have to take this into consideration when we're, when we're, when we're trying to find out if we need to supplement diets uh, with manganese or not. On the other hand, the content in vertebrae and whole fish and liver, uh, especially uh, for vertebrae, increased slightly with increasing contents of manganese in the diet. And actually, this has been observed previously in other species, in grouper, in salmon, in tilapia, in carbs. And some authors have, suggest have suggested that uh, manganese deposition in the vertebrae is highly responsive to dietary manganese. And yes, this is something that we already also saw. As you can remember, in humans, manganese in the bone, stored in the bone, uh, accounts for 40% of the total manganese stored in the body. So it is a very important uh, storage uh, uh, tissue for manganese. We conducted some gene expression analysis and we could observe that manganese superoxide dismutase expression decreased with increasing dietary manganese supplementation over 30 milligrams per kilogram. And the broken line model suggested that the, that the level would be around 44 milligrams per kilogram. And we also saw higher catalase expression in the diet without supplementation of manganese, suggesting that this fish could present, could have a higher oxidative risk. So with all this in mind, uh, in the present study, and there's markers for growth, for utilization, for tissue mineral composition, etc., suggested that the manganese content present in the basal diet was sufficient to cover these requirements, at least for these, for these parameters. However, oxidative stress-related genes might indicate that there must be a higher uh, risk without manganese orientation, okay? And so therefore, if we, if we have, we might suggest that if we have a condition in which fish are exposed to, to a higher oxidative status, we might need to include higher levels of manganese supplementation. And how, how is this? Well, the presence of manganese in higher concentrations in these plant ingredients compared to, to fish meal and fish oil suggests that the practical diets based on plant ingredients may contain enough manganese to cover the requirements for gillhead seabring, at least for the, for the first parameters described here. So then moving on to the selenium trial. This trial was also published back in 2019 on aquaculture nutrition. It's also open access, but if someone is interested in having the, the, the paper, just let me know and I will send it. So we saw that an increase in dietary selenium up to around 0.9 resulted in a significant growth increase in terms of standard length and final weight, and also in specific growth rate. And we also saw that there was an accumulation of whole body selenium up until around the same level. These results were similar to those obtained in, in cobia. And interestingly, as you can see, for growth, further supplementation beyond this one milligram per kilogram, specifically 
cause a significant reduction in the growth, which much indicated that there was probably uh, a negative effect of, of selenium, probably due to toxicity. And actually, we saw that uh, elevation up to one milligram per kilogram reduced significantly the expression of uh, glutathione peroxidase. And we saw that further supplementation significantly increased catalase uh, gene expression, indicating that these fish are, uh, are under an increased oxidative stress. And actually, in the present study, we did see symptoms of hepatic uh, hydropic de degeneration only in those fish fed the highest levels of selenium, which is in agreement with the higher oxidative risk and the lower growth found in these fish. And actually, these results agree with others observed in carp that were caused by a dietary uh, excess of selenium. So in conclusion, the results of this study suggested that the optimum dietary levels of total selenium in the diets with 10% uh, fish meal and basal levels of around 0.45 milligrams per kilogram of selenium are around 0.94 milligrams per kilogram. And if we increase the dietary levels up to 1.7 milligram per kilogram, we found negative effects. These were caused by toxicity and the symptoms associated to this toxicity were reduction in growth, uh, increased oxidative stress and hepatic damage. And the last trial we're talking about today is the trial on copper. This was published in aquaculture in 2019. And once again, if anyone is interested in, in this paper, just let me know and I will send it to him. So we, what we observed in this trial was that a supplementation of copper from 5.5 milligrams per kilogram present in the basal diet all the way up to 9.3 milligrams per kilogram did not improve growth. However, further uh, levels of copper beyond this 9.3 milligrams per kilogram caused a significant reduction in growth. And we actually saw that increasing copper to the highest level, 32 milligrams per kilogram, increased T-bar values, which is one of the most commonly used indicators of tissue peroxidation. And in, the, in this study, we saw that increasing the dietary copper, spe specifically up to the highest levels, caused different symptoms of uh, hepatic uh, damage, so damage in the liver, leading to symptoms such as steatosis, broken cell margin, cholestasis. And actually, these symptoms were very similar to those observed in rainbow trout and tilapia exposed to toxic copper. So with this in mind, we, we observe that no supplementation of copper in the diet with these diets already containing 5.5 milligrams per kilogram of copper were enough to present the best values for growth, productive parameters, molecular markers, tissue copper, uh, T-bars and hepatic histology, whereas levels beyond 9.3 cause toxicity in many of these parameters. And this led us to think that there is a safe, safe margin for copper supplementation from 5.5 to 9.3 milligrams per kilogram. Remember that this 5.5 is a diet without copper supplementation. So this is the copper naturally present in the ingredients used. And if we include levels of copper beyond 9.3, we already see signs of toxicity. And if you remember, copper supplementation in the diets can be included up to more than 20 milligrams per kilogram in the diet, according to EFSA. But we already observed toxicity be, uh, beyond 9.3, which is less than half the maximum upper limit. So this is something that, uh, that should be considered uh, in Sebring. 
So we designed this very short summary for these three trials. And this summary has been published in, in, a, in, a, in a journal called uh, Interna Fishing Field International. And this summary basically presents in yellow the levels of the different minerals that were tested in the three trials, in the perform fish trials. These levels in orange would be what were considered Atlantic salmon requirements. In gray, we had the results that we obtained when we conducted the trials with the RAINA uh, trial, the RAINA project. In this trial, we had different, up to I think 20 nutrients being changed in the same time in a premix. So we couldn't pinpoint exactly what was the optimum level, but we managed to get an approximate uh, level uh, by the use of specific biomarkers. And this publication has also it's also been it's also open access. So if you want it, you can access it. And this would be what you would call the optimum levels described in the in this perform fish trial. So as you can see, they are lower than for the Arrhina and for the Atlantic salmon. And these arrows in red would be the toxic levels that we observe, okay? So we must be very, very careful when supplemented selenium because as you can see the levels between optimum and toxic are quite, they are, the margin is very short and with copper, the margin is even lower. So with this in mind, uh, this is what I had to say about minerals. I think I'm a bit ahead of schedule, but if you, if you want some, if someone has questions, just let me know, please. Okay. Thank you, David. I think we don't have any question by now. If you have any question, please do not forget to ask in the Q&A box. Since you are not allowed to, to open your microphone. So if you have any question, you can write in this box now, or if not, you, we can move to the next presentation also by David Dominguez. I think no questions then, Marta. Okay, I think we will move. So next presentation is also made by David Dominguez. Uh, uh, there is one question you can ask David, maybe? Yes, okay. So Samuel is asking, is there any studies related to this in reproductive stage of fish? Yes, I think um, actually um, Professor Marisol Izquierdo and Hipólito Fernández Palacios a couple of years ago, they had some uh, publications on gillhead sebrim working with selenium, I think it is, but not in the performed fish trial, no. And as you may know, it's very difficult to work with broodstock, especially broodstock nutrition, because you have to, it takes very long time. So you have to know when you're feeding them, then you have to, to see the offspring, you, you, ha you have to check for fertility rates, for uh, fecundity rates, for larval survival, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then you have to wait until this larvae grow enough. So, and of course, the broodstock is the most important uh, asset that you have in a, in a hatchery. So you don't want to mess too much with them, right? So yes, they are lengthy studies, they are costly studies, and, and therefore there's still a huge ground uh, to cover in that aspect, yes. Okay, we have uh, two more questions, if you can ask David. Yes. Uh, okay. One of them, uh, I can read to you if you want. <laughs> Hello, concentrations given are for fish body weight or feet? In the trial that I presented, uh, so the concentrations 
of the diet were milligrams per kilogram of feed. And then on the tissues, we had some of the results were on body weight. Some of the results were on liver. Some of the results were on vertebra. So there are different, for example, some of the, of the minerals, in this case, manganese was a good example, or even zinc, tend to accumulate more in vertebra. They tend to deposit more in the vertebra. So several authors have claimed that their this could be a good marker to assess manganese and zinc uptake, okay? Okay, so the last question from Vasily Skaralasos. Do you have any information on the interactions between these minerals? How would the dietary level of one affect the optimal level of the other? Yes, Vasilis always has uh, very good questions. For those of you who don't know, Vasilis is a uh, He's a researcher in, uh, in Biomar, and we worked together in the Arraina project. And actually, we did some very nice studies on, on sources for, for different minerals, zinc, manganese, selenium. And, and we did see that different sources are, are the bioavailability of these different sources for the different minerals is completely different. Uh, but no, Vasilis, in, up in this project, in the perform fish, we evaluated different uh, minerals also. Okay, so not we didn't evaluate only the mineral that we were studying. We also man evaluated the minerals, uh, the, the the other mineral, the profile of other minerals, and we didn't see uh, a significant effect. So we didn't see a reduction in one in another mineral by increasing one in the diet. Okay, we have some interesting results in larvae but they are not from this project and, and we are about to publish them. So I hope you can wait a bit for that. I will send you the, the paper, of course. Okay, uh, so we will move to the next presentation. David, you have a couple of questions more in the, in the box. Maybe you can answer the, and write your, your answer right there. So yes. now we will move to the to the next presentation also made by uh, David Dominguez regarding the recommended dietary levels of vitam vitamins in this case for uh, sea cream. So. Okay, thank you, Marta. I, I think I can just, I have one, the last question, I think I can, I can reply really, really quickly if you don't mind, Marta, by Arefin Raman. And the question is, is there any difference between marine and freshwater fish species in the requirement of minerals? Yes, there is. Uh, in the, as you may know, the concentration of minerals in the in the water, in fresh water, is much lower than in than in the sea, and some of these minerals can be absorbed by the gills. However, the presence of other minerals can also hinder the absorption the absorption of these minerals in sea in the sea. Okay, so so you also have to play with this with this in mind. You also have to have this in mind. You may have more minerals in the sea, which can therefore be uptaken by the gills, reducing the, the, the dietary requirement in marine species. But you can also have other minerals in the, in the sea, in the marine sea, that are competing between each other to be absorbed by the gills, okay? So yes, there are, there are differences, okay? Okay, uh, thank you, Marta. So yes, I'm going to move on. I see that now I'm spot on on, the, on my time slot. And as you were saying, Marta, I'm going to talk about uh, recommended dietary levels of vitamins. So now moving on to vitamins. Oops. Okay, so vitamins are essential micronutrients because fish cannot synthesize de novo, which means that they have to be a uh, uptaken by the diet. Some people might argue, oh, but there's, uh, you know, your gut microbiota can produce a certain amount of vitamin K and of vitamin B12, for instance. Yes, but that's the gut microbiota. It's not the fish. So yes, it's a completely different organism. Therefore, these are essential. And vitamins are divided into two categories, fat soluble, which are a, D, E, and K, 
and water soluble, which are the vitamin B, B complex, and vitamin C. This means that you can uh, give the vitamins in uh, aqueous solution for the water soluble vitamins, but you need to supplement them uh, with an oil or with another type of fat to include these fat soluble vitamins. Okay, and the storage of these two different types of vitamins is completely different. Fat soluble vitamins are stored in fatty tissues, for example, liver and adipose tissue, but also even in, in the eggs, for example. And water soluble vitamins are not stored except vitamin B9, which can be stored in the liver for a couple of months, and vitamin B12, which can be stored for some years, at least in humans, this has been confirmed. What are the, uh, how, what's the chances of having a deficiency, a hypovitaminosis? Well, of fat-soluble vitamins, since they are stored, it is less common, but water-soluble vitamins deficiencies are more common. Therefore, what are the, like, what's the, the, what are the chances of having an excess or, or hypervitaminosis for fat-soluble vitamins? Since they are stored, it is more likely they are not excreted in the urine, so they can be stored for longer periods, and therefore you can have a hypervitaminosis. For water-soluble vitamin, they are excreted in the urine all the time, constantly, so the, it is less common to find an excess. Transport, they usually require a transporter for fat-soluble vitamins and are usually free of transporters for water-soluble vitamins. And the intake would be, at least in humans, the, they would be um, required to be intake weekly, two to, two to three times per week for fat-soluble vitamins. But you need a constant intake of water-soluble vitamins because they are excreted constantly. So vitamin A, we have... Uh, different sources of vitamin A. Uh, I'm going to refer as vitamin A. I'm not going to, to refer as retinol retinals or the retinoic, but something interesting to say is that we have uh, provitamins, which are basically carotenes, alpha, beta, gamma, which can then be transformed into vitamin A. Okay. And actually this, Vitamin A or these uh, provitamins are absorbed through the gut uh, by the, from the diet. They move into the enterocyte. They are transformed and moved uh, through by the lymph into the liver, which then either transforms them or stores them or moves them into the circulation to the different tissues. And this vitamin is directly involved in several functions, including skeletogenesis, regulating cartilage development, uh, by controlling their function, maturation, proliferation. And it's also essential for vision. Uh, and one of the first, uh, in humans, one of the first symptoms of, um, of um, deficiency of vitamin A was night uh, blindness. This was uh, described already in the ancient Egypt, and the treatment was to feed people liver because liver has high levels of vitamin A. And it's also involved in cell differentiation and reproduction. Now, moving on to vitamin D, we have several provitamins for vitamin D. We find ergosterol in plants. Ergosterol uh, requires uh, UVB light from the sun to be transformed into vitamin D2. And we also have seven, the hydrocholesterol, which is uh, produced uh, in the liver, for instance, and it can also be included in the diet. And it follows a similar pattern, requiring from this uh, sunlight, from this UVB, to be transformed into the active form uh, cholecalciferol vitamin D3. This can also be in, uh, supplemented in the diet, and, and then it, is, uh, it continues its metabolic pathway. So how does vitamin D uh, work? Well, 
Vitamin D is tightly associated to calcium and phosphate and nutrition and movement in the body. So we have a parathyroid hormone and calcitonin, which are both uh, excreted by the parathyroid. I don't know if I said that correctly. Uh, and this control, they regulate total calcium and phosphate in the body. However, as you can see, both of them reduce phosphate and phosphate is essential for ATP. ATP being your energy uh, molecule, your energy in the body. And therefore vitamin D is essential because it not only regulates calcium, but also phosphate absorption in the gut. Okay, so vitamin D is going to to play as a good guy in this in this uh, in this movie, and therefore it's mainly involved in calcium and phosphate homeostasis, and as I said, acts in synergy with calcitonin and PTH, and and therefore it also intervenes in calcium remodeling from the bone and renal calcium absorption, but also in the immune response. And the last fat soluble vitamin I'm going to be talking today is vitamin K. You have three main sources of vitamin K. K1, phylloquinone is mainly found in green leafy vegetables. Vitamin K2 is mainly find, found in bacteria and in liver and also in some fish species like eels. And then the synthetic form of vitamin K is vitamin K3, menadion, which is the one that is mainly employed in the aquaculture feed industry. So vitamin K is absorbed, is uptaken in the diet. It is uh, transported uh, from the, to the liver and the liver then excreted in the bile or it can be sent to the different tissues. So once it goes into the, into the feed, we have a vitamin K in the reduced form, which is active. Then we have the gamma carboxylation and then it's oxidized, which is the inactive form. And to try to recover that vitamin K, we have the epoxide reductase. And I put there this warfarin, which is a, it's a, it's a compound that you use, for example, to, to kill rats and mice. And this, it blocks this enzyme, which means that there is no more vitamin K synthesis. And vitamin K is essential in blood clotting. So as you can see, uh, you have coagulation factors that through gamma carboxylation become active. If you block uh, epoxide reductase with warfarin, you have a problem with coagulation and you have a problem with bleeding, basically. So essential vitamin, another essential vitamin, mainly involved in blood clotting, but also inhibiting bone resorption and uh, promoting the bone mineralization. And interestingly, it avoids calcification of soft tissues. And then we're going to move on to the water soluble vitamins. Vitamin B1, thiamine, it acts as a coenzyme, as a cofactor in ATP production, energy. Once again, we have this ATP molecule, essential, and it acts as a dehydrogenase, which reduces, uh, uh, Yes, basically dehydrogenase, we are adding this CoA, which is essential for, for example, carbohydrate metabolism. So we have carbohydrate in the diet, we have glycolysis, we can also have this pentose phosphate pathway, and all these enzymes require vitamin B1. Also, when you're going into the Krebs cycle, we have pyruvate dehydrogenase, which requires vitamin B1. Uh, in the Krebs cycle, we also have another enzyme that requires B1. 
if we feed the fish proteins, we might have a branch chain proteins, which also requires vitamin D1. And if we have lipids, lipids uh, can, can have uh, free fatty acids or ketones, and this produces uh, succinyl-CoA and then acetyl-CoA. And of course, once again, this uh, enzyme uh, is requires vitamin B1. I'm seeing some, some people raising their hands, but can we, I will, ask, I will answer the, the questions at the end of the, of the presentation, okay? Okay, so next to vitamins, folate, B9, cobalamin, B12. We can have B9 in the diet coming from green leafy vegetables or also meat, liver or fish. The, the folic acid is transformed into tetrahydrofolate, which is the active form of B9. It's essential for DNA synthesis, for instance, and it also uh, acts in synergy with vitamin B12, cobalamin. And cobalamin can also be included in the diet with uh, fish, meat, uh, liver and other tissues, and also clams and mussels. And cobalamin is essential for the synthesis of methionine which is an essential amino acid because it is, uh, it intervenes in methionine synthase. And also it's essential, both vitamins actually, in the production of succinyl-CoA, which can then produce hemoglobin, essential for the red blood cells, or it can go into the Krebs cycle once again, and therefore obtain ATP, which is our energy source. So these three vitamins are essential. They need to be uh, introduced in the diet. And as you could see, they are essential because they intervene in energy metabolism, in the synthesis of amino acid, in the synthesis of DNA and RNA, uh, in the correct functioning of the blood, in hematopoiesis, etc. However, what do we already know about uh, fat soluble vitamin requirements? Well, some requirements have been established for different species, for Atlantic salmon, for cod. But when we started this trial, there was no information or, or well, not no information. There were no requirements established for gilded zebra. We had some studies that had a different, maybe one or two levels of supplementation of vitamin A. There were very nice studies in which you could see the metabolism of these vitamins, especially on nuclear receptors, but they were not defined as classic requirements because with three or two levels, it is very difficult to pinpoint a requirement. And then with the water soluble vitamins, we only had one study back in the nineties on Gilhead Sebring and once again, it was, it cannot be considered a requirement study because it only contained a couple of levels of, um, of this uh, vitamin B1 in this case. So once again, no real requirements for water-soluble vitamin for DHC sebring. And I have to add that in this case also, we didn't have any of these studies. None of these studies was conducted using high levels of plant ingredients in the diet. So the levels in, of B vitamins and of fat soluble vitamins, when we're changing the traditional marine ingredients, fish meal and fish oil, and we're changing them by plant ingredients, once again, the levels are completely different. And therefore we need to reevaluate the requirements for these for this, uh, nutrients. And with this in mind, we designed four trials similar uh, approach as the uh, mineral studies. In this case, we had three different trials for the fat soluble vitamins. So one trial with vitamin A, one trial with vitamin D, and one with vitamin K. Five different levels, being level number three, what would be considered optimum for all species or from already what already was described in the literature. 
Level number one would be a diet without supplementation, so only containing the level of vitamin A, D, or K present in the ingredients. And level number five would be an excess. And then we had one trial in which we changed at the same time the concentration of B1, B9, and B12. The basal diet was exactly the same as the mineral trial with low levels of fish meal and fish oil, and it was produced by scratching. And as I was mentioning, we had three separate trials for vitamin A, D, and K. Sources of vitamin A, red meal acetate. For D, it was D3, and for K, it was K3. And one trial in which we changed at the same time B1, B9, and B12. Okay, this last trial, this, I have to mention, this cannot be considered a classic uh, requirement study because we're changing the three levels at the same time, okay? But at least we get an idea of, of where the things are aiming towards, okay? The experimental conditions were similar, were exactly the same actually to the uh, mineral trials. It's roughly the same number of fish, three tanks for each of the treatments, similar initial weight, and once again, they were manually fit until apparent association uh, up until when the fish were at least twice the weight uh, that they were when they started the trial. Similar uh, approach when taking samples, we had biochemical analysis, we had vitamin composition in this case, and we had different. Um, Evaluation for uh, skeletal anomalies, histology, gene expression, and of course, statistic analysis. And moving on to the results, I'm going to be as brief as possible. For the vitamin A trial, we observed an increase in growth, a slight increase in growth at the third level, despite that the levels were already quite large in the basal diet. And, and we didn't see an effect on the feed efficiency or SGR or FCR. We did see uh, an accumulation, and this was significant, in the liver uh, with increasing dietary vitamin A. And this was expected because, uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, vitamin A is mainly stored in the liver. So this shows that, yes, the fish were uptaking the vitamin A correctly. And we did see a very interesting pattern uh, which related to the skeletal anomalies uh, prevalence. And we saw, for example, uh, a lower prehimeral or abdominal lordosis in, in fish fed the intermediate levels. Now, moving on to the vitamin D trial. This trial was published last year in aquaculture. Once again, it is open access. So if anyone has an interest on this, on this uh, paper, just send me an email and I, will, and I will send the paper. So interestingly, we didn't find any significant differences in growth at the end of the trial, despite the fish had more than double their initial weight. We did see an increase in, in the vitamin deposition in the liver. Once again, this was expected because uh, vitamin D is deposited in the liver. So once again, this showed that yes, fish were uptaking the, the vitamin D and they were absorbing it. And, but we did see something interesting in the uh, premaxillary and or the maxillary in which uh, the highest levels of vitamin D cause a significant increase actually in, in the prevalence of, this, of these anomalies. And at a histological level, we saw higher levels of a uh, very interesting output here, which was swollen cardiac muscle. So the higher the level of vitamin D, the higher the prevalence of this, of this uh, observation. And therefore, based on the reduction in skeletal disorders and there was no differences in growth and the, the occurrence of this swollen cardiac muscle, 
we decided, we settled on this 11.6 international units per gram of feed that would be optimal for vitamin D. And then moving on to, to the vitamin K trial, this was, was published this year in Agriculture Nutrition, also open access. Also, if you have any interest, just let me know and I will gladly send you the paper. We saw uh, an increase in growth in the fourth level. Oops, sorry. And, and we didn't see an effect on other uh, performance parameters. We saw an increase in the GRP relative expression, and we pinpointed this level at around 10 milligrams per kilogram of vitamin K. And we saw a reduction of the prevalence of total skeletal anomalies with increasing dietary vitamin K. And actually, at the end of the day, when you compare the growth, the GRP expression, and the reduced prevalence of skeletal disorders, we settled on this 12 milligrams per kilogram of vitamin K as the optimum level for yielded sibling juveniles. And to finish, moving on to the B vitamin trial. This was the trial with vitamins B1, 9, and 12. We, we had almost a total survival and we didn't have any deficiency signs, which meant that there were no um, apparent signs of vitamin deficiency. There were no effects on, on final weight, despite the final, uh, the, the feed acceptance was good in all the treatments and fish more than doubled their weight at the end of the trial. And there were also no significant differences in terms of hepatosomatic index, visosomatic index, or liver proximal composition. However, we did see that increasing the levels of dietary vitamin B1 increased the whole body vitamin B1. And actually, when we compared this with the initial sample, we saw that if we didn't supplement vitamin B1, we observed a 51% reduction in the vitamin B1 content when compared to the initial samples. And this level would only be recovered with the third level of supplementation. Fourth level, sorry, fourth level supplementation. A similar observation was made in B9. We saw a tendency to increase the content in the whole body with increasing dietary content. The level that was um, reduced of, uh, of B9 was only, uh, we only recovered it after, not this one, but a bit lower after we supplemented vitamin B9. And similar result was obtained with vitamin B12, in which we also saw a positive response to the inclusion of vitamin B12 in the diet with the concentration of B12 in the fish. We also saw a slight reduction of B12 without supplementation. And when we included supplementation, we could recover it after, after a slight supplementation. Now, we also did some gene expression. We, for example, analyzed a, a folate carrier uh, marker, and we saw that the highest level was in the third supplementation level. And we also analyzed this enzyme, which uh, vitamin B12 is involved uh, in the production and the synthesis of uh, methionine. And we saw a significant increase with the highest level of supplementation. We also uh, conducted blood smears, and we observed a slight reduction of uh, the irregular nuclear erythrocytes with increasing levels of vitamin B9 and B12, which, as you may recall, are the vitamins which are involved in, in hematopoiesis, in blood synthesis. So with all this in mind, and based on whole fish and the expression of, the, of a marker and the reduction of, uh, of irregular nucleus erythrocytes, we described that the 6.1 milligram per kilogram of vitamin B1, uh, 3.32 of B9, and 0 0.08 of B12 might be the optimum level of supplementation for these B vitamins. And I would like to finish my presentation with an insight into the future, if we can say so, 
So future perspective. So both for mineral and vitamin nutrition, uh, what is the future ahead? Well, we know that the, pop the population is increasing and it's increasing rapidly. If we add global warming predictions to this scenario, we, in which of course we will have probably alterations of the production of the of the of the farm productions of the vegetable production yield in the coming years we don't find a very nice uh, future ahead of us it's kind of bleak and actually uh, we are already seeing this the prices of the ingredients are changing rapidly every day we had a very nice discussion with the Basilis in the last uh, conference in Italy, in the International Symposium of Fish Nutrition and Feeding. And, and yes, so if we also add other things that are cannot be included in these predictions, such as wars, like the ongoing war in Ukraine, a pandemic, coronavirus, or even an error in the transport of materials in the Suez Canal, we are, well, the future is a bit bleak, let's say. And therefore, feed producers must, must have, must be able to use, to have this feed ingredient flexibility. This means that feed producers must be able to use different feed sources in the future to compensate for the increasing prices of certain ingredients. They need to use, to be able to use alternative ingredients that are probably uh, produced locally in case there's, a, there's an issue with transports, uh, for worldwide transport, because nowadays we are a, we're a, a globalized economy, right? And therefore, these uh, feed producers must have this feed ingredient flexibility. And we will see in the coming, in the coming presentations and in the coming days, uh, several presentations with novel ingredients, which are very promising, but this also, has a, an issue here that what happens with micronutrients? Well, if we take into consideration that already changing from fish meal and fish oil to plant ingredients, we are already finding differences, then of course this is going to be uh, an issue. And I think we have to address it, address it as academia and the EU will have to address it as the, as the administration in charge of this, okay? So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm glad to respond, reply them. Okay, David, thank you. Uh, yes, we have a, a few minutes for a couple of questions. Uh, I can read to you the first question, for instance. Uh, if water-soluble vitamin does not store, then how fish can be a source of these vitamins? I mean, there should be some limit for other water-soluble vitamins. I saw in several literature related to water-soluble vitamins, which indicate the continuous improvement in liver water-soluble vitamin concentration up to certain levels. Can you explain this? Yes. Remember, some of these B vitamins can be stored, B9 and B12 specifically, they can be stored in the liver for several months or several years. Um, so this is, is one way. Then, of course, depending on the fish, when we're talking about fish containing B vitamins, these B vitamins are either present when the fish is captured in the fisheries or when they are harvested in the farm. So they are already there, okay? Uh, and this happens with minerals too. Some minerals are stored easierly and some are, they are not stored. So, so there is always uh, this amount present in the fish. What I'm talking about storage, when I, when in terms of storage, is if we if we feed a fish a diet without this water soluble vitamin for some time, it will eventually lose it. Okay, but these vitamins are still being used in the tissues. They are being used in the formation of blood. They are being used in the formation of amino acids. So they are there. It's not that they get into the body and and they are completely. Uh, eradicated, you know, they are completely evacuated. They are being used. It's just that since they are being used, they are also being depleted. But this takes this takes time. This takes the, the body, the metabolism to, 
to work through this. And that's why you also have some vitamins, some B vitamins, okay? Okay, thank you. So uh, next question also regarding your percentage of skeleton anomalies in, uh, are these measuring individual fish or a total population of fish per treatment? In the vitamins, right? Okay, so we we took a representative sample of the of the fish in the tanks. Okay, this would always be at least thirty percent of the fish in the tank. We put them aside. We didn't do anything with them. We froze them. We did X-rays, and then on those thirty percent of the fish, we evaluated the skeletal anomalies, and the results are in percentage of the population. So from this 30%, we would say, okay, if all of the fish are affected by an anomaly, we would say 100% of the fish are have this anomaly, okay? Okay, so uh, I think we can answer one more question because we are uh, delaying a little bit. So um, next question, the gene expression slide for folate carrier, the R square is low and the P value is high. How about the trend equation? The R square is low, so the p value was significant. That's the important aspect, right? The p value, I think it was 0 0.05 or below 0 0.05 for sure. So that basically shows the R square, uh, as you may know, it indicates uh, the, the, the fitness of, to the curve, but the important uh, parameter here is the p value. And if it's significant, then then you're good to go. And actually, most reviewers would always ask for you to include the p-value. Yes. Okay, so I think we can, you can uh, answer the, the other questions uh, if, you, if you want a bit in the, in the box. Yeah. And we will move to the next presentation. Can, can I just include one very tiny, very, very tiny comment here, Marta? Yes, of course. Okay, sorry for the other panelists. One very interesting thing that we found out, okay, because in this perform fish trial, we we made a, a diet with the recommended levels for the fat soluble and water soluble and manganese diet and mineral diet. So we made one diet with all these recommendations, and we fed it to gilhead sea bream and sea bass. And as you can see, the so the blue one would be a diet with high fish meal and fish oil. The orange one would be the diet with our recommended levels. It would be a, a commercial diet with higher levels of plant-based ingredients. And then you have a, a green diet, with, which is a commercial diet with levels that are not the ones that we recommended. And as you can see, fish grow better with our recommendations. So there's certainly something uh, behind it. Okay, that was all. Thank you.